When I was a kid, every Christmas we would drive from our home in Dallas up to see my grandparents and family in Oklahoma City. And uh, if you've ever made that drive along I-35 from Dallas up to Oklahoma, uh, you, you know that the road cuts right through what is known as the uh, Arbuckle Mountains. Uh, I think we, we may need, there we go, right up through what is known as the Arbuckle Mountains. I'm going to show you guys a picture of what it looks like as you drive along I-35. Some of y'all have seen this. It's really pretty remarkable because uh, the interstate is like blasted right through the middle of the Arbuckle Mountains. You can see the rocks on either side. And I remember as a kid just being fascinated as we drove through these mountains. They were the first mountains that I ever really experienced because, again, I grew up in Dallas. There's not any mountains in the Dallas area. I remember asking my dad if we could climb them, if we could pull over and climb up the side of those cliffs. And, and in fact, one day on our way to Oklahoma, he, we did. We pulled over. We climbed up one. My dad was a geologist by training, so he gathered some fossils and showed them to us. I just remember thinking it was so cool. And I thought, how could there ever be mountains more glorious than these? <laughs> now, you're laughing because, of course, you know that the, the highest of the Arbuckle Mountains uh, is about 1,400 feet. They barely qualify as mountains. I didn't realize until I was maybe eight or nine years old that there were mountains much, much, much higher because our family visited Colorado. And of course, there are dozens of mountains in the Rockies in Colorado that are 10 times, literally 14,000 feet plus, 10 times as high as any mountain in the Arbuckle Mountains. But until you've seen the really high mountains... You, you wouldn't know that. These would look glorious until you saw mountains of much greater glory. These would look grand until you knew there are mountains that are much, much, much grander. Now, the reason I share that is because uh, when we read the book of Hebrews, especially chapter 1, the writer of Hebrews makes this same type of comparison between the glory of the angels and the glory of Jesus. And essentially what he says is this, if you've ever seen an angel, an angel is, is majestic and, and powerful and bright and reflects the glory of God. If you've ever seen an angel, you're going to be impressed. You remember last week we talked about how in the scripture, angels are not like the precious moments angels that are completely non-threatening. If you've ever seen It's a Wonderful Life, they're not like Clarence Oddbody, the kind of confused and befuddled angel that you see in there. Angels are impressive. Angels are glorious. But they're nothing compared to Jesus. So that those angels that announced Jesus on the very first Christmas, I mean, they, they, they blew those shepherds away. But what we don't want to miss about the Christmas story is that uh, they saw something even greater than those angels that night. And it was the baby in the manger in Bethlehem. Hebrews chapter 1 the writer says this, and he, that is Jesus, he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. In other words, the writer of Hebrews says, yeah, those angels are grand. Jesus is grander. And why, why does he make this case? Well, as you go through the book of Hebrews, you're going to find that essentially the writer of Hebrews, he's writing to a group of people who were tempted to go back into Judaism. They're tempted to go back into the observance of the Old Testament law because to them, man, that's where the glory of God is found. You think about it, God gives his law to Moses on Mount Sinai through the mediation of angels. And Moses is, is the greatest prophet in their view in the entire history of the universe. The law is given to them by God. And so they're, they're going, why would we worship this Jesus guy when we have something already that's so glorious in the law. And so what the writer of Hebrews does is he says, no, you, you've missed it. You need to understand Jesus is better. 
He's better than Moses. He's better than the law. He's better than the angels. In fact, Jesus is better than anything else that you would want to worship or trust. Jesus is better than anything else you could worship or trust. My guess is that Nobody in this room at the moment is tempted to go back to the Old Testament law and begin sacrificing lambs and goats or trying to follow all of the codes of the law, right? But there's probably something you're tempted to trust other than Jesus. As we, as we finish out a year where, where life for many of us has been upended, where life for many of us has been unpredictable, chaotic, maybe even difficult, maybe even sad, my guess is there's something in your daily life you are tempted to trust other than Jesus. And it's probably something good. It's probably something glorious. Maybe you say, you know what, I really want to find life and peace and hope in my family, in my marriage through my kids. Maybe, maybe you say, I want to find hope and peace and life in, in some career or in a job, and, I, and if I can just get to a certain pinnacle in my life with my career, that's where I know I will have made it, and I won't have worries anymore, and my life will be the way I want my life to be. Or maybe it's, man, if I can just find financial security can get out of debt, I can, I can pay that off, I can build up enough savings, I can just be financially secure, I won't have to worry anymore, I will feel at peace, and my life will be the way that I want it to be. And so what we do is we place all of our trust, all of our energy, all of our hope in this thing that may be great, but its glory pales in comparison to the glory of Jesus. That's the essence of the book of Hebrews, and really that's the essence of the of the Christmas story is that throughout all of human history, all of us have been trying to recapture what the, the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, had in the Garden of Eden with God. They had an unbroken relationship with God. They had perfect relationships with one another. They had everything that they needed, all the food. They had all the provision. They had all the peace they needed. And yet through their sin and ours, we broke that relationship with God. And here's what we try to do. We say, you know what? I think that I can recreate Eden if I can just get the right stuff, right? If I can just get the right things in my life, the, the right amount of food, the right amount of money, the right relationships, whatever it may be. And so we try to fix the problems without trusting in God. And the message of Christmas is that God sent Jesus into our world because we, we can't fix it. We broke our relationship with God, and as a result, we've broken the world itself. And so Jesus comes into the world to fix it. The baby in a manger grew as a perfect man, perfectly representative of God, died in our place, rose again from the dead. It says, you want life, you want a relationship with God, you want something to trust that will not fade away, that will not let you down, that will not disappoint you, even in 2020. It's Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, one of his most famous quotes is this one, talking about how we seek desires apart from God. He says this, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex, and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. What's his point? Jesus is better than anything else you would worship or trust. I want to look at Hebrews 1 this morning then and talk about why. Why is Jesus better? And by the end, I hope, I hope we'll, we'll come to a point where we say, you know what, I want to transfer my hope. I want to transfer my hope from these things that I trust in to the greatness of Jesus. Why is Jesus better? Hebrews chapter 1, the first reason is this, because he is God. Follow with me as we read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. God, after he spoke long ago, to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us in his son, 
whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your Companions. This in Hebrews chapter 1 is one of the most powerful and direct statements of the deity of Jesus, the Godhood of Jesus. It's one of the most powerful statements in all of the Bible. Jesus is the exact representation of the nature of God. He upholds all things by the word of his power. The book of Colossians says something very similar, that Jesus, as he speaks, he holds the universe together. Everything would fly apart if it wasn't for Jesus. Jesus was there at the creation of the world and is involved in the creation of the world because he is God in the flesh. He is the second person of the Trinity. So when we read Genesis chapter chapter 1, and it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When we talk about God, we mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is every bit as present and active in the creation of the world, in the sustaining of the world as the Father himself. That's what Hebrews is saying. And he's saying, tell me what angel is as great as Jesus. There isn't one. Angels are glorious. Angels speak powerfully the words of God, but they are not even close to the glory of Jesus Christ. And why is that important for us as we think about transferring our trust, transferring our allegiance from the things of this earth to the things of Jesus? Here's why. Jesus is the only one who can bring us to God the Father. Jesus is the only one who can bring us to a place of restoration of all that we lost through sin. Jesus is the only one that can bring us there. I read a story this past week about Tad Lincoln. Tad Lincoln was the youngest of Abraham Lincoln's children, the youngest son. So he was a little boy when Abraham Lincoln was the president of the United States. And there's this great story, true story, written down by one of Lincoln's friends, that uh, during the war, there was a group of men from Kentucky, some politicians from Kentucky, who came to visit President Lincoln. They wanted to make some sort of appeal to the president. There was something they wanted. And so they showed up at the White House. Back then, you could just apparently show up, and you could wait until the president had time to see you. But the president didn't want to see them because he knew why they were there. And so for a week, he avoided these guys. He didn't didn't invite them in. He made sure he didn't see them. He he avoided them whenever he he came and he went from the White House because he didn't want to talk to them. So after about a week, these guys were frustrated, these men from Kentucky. And so they said, you know what, we're just going to go. We're going to leave. And on the way out, they were grumbling how unfair it was that they didn't have an opportunity to get an audience with old Abe as they called him. Well, it just so happened that Tad Lincoln overheard the conversation and he laughed and he went up to these men and he said, would you guys like to see old Abe? And they said, well, yes, we would, but we can't. And he goes, hold on just a minute. Runs into his dad's office, goes, hey, dad, I met some friends outside. Would you like to meet them? Abraham Lincoln says, of course, son, I'd love to meet any of your friends. Bring them in. So he runs back out grabs them, goes, follow me, walks them straight into the presence of the president of the United States and says, I'd like to introduce you to my friends. And of course, the president saw them and thought, oh no. But he said, it's all right, son. Any friend of yours is a friend of mine. The son can get you access to the father in a way that nobody else can. That's what Hebrews 1 is saying about Jesus. You and I have broken our relationship with God through our own rebellion, our own disobedience, our own sin. So God sends the Son to usher us into the presence of the Father. Only the Son 
can get you there. The angels can tell you about God. The angels can reflect the glory of God, but they can't bring you into his presence. Only Jesus can. And so the writer of Hebrews, he's saying to these men and women who are tempted to abandon Jesus for some lesser version of religion, he says, no, 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 you don't understand. The glory of Jesus is so much greater because Jesus is the only one that can bring you back to the Father. Jesus is the only one that can restore all that you lost. If you're looking for life, if you're looking for hope, if you're looking for a future, if you're looking for a place where all that you need will be provided, you need to know the only place that hope exists is through Jesus Christ. Because through his death and resurrection, he promises a life to all who will trust in him in which everything that was lost will be restored. A perfect relationship with God, a perfect relationship with his people. So he says, Jesus is so much better than whatever you would worship or trust because he is God. Christmas itself is proof that God wants to know you. Christmas itself is proof that God wants to to know you. And you say, well, I don't feel worthy of God wanting to know me. See, that's the good news. We're not. But God loves us, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. It's not, hey, we were so good, so worthy, so put together that God said they deserve it. That's not the good news. Because God loves you. He stepped into time and history and space so you can know him. Jesus is better because he is God. And then the writer goes on, he says, Jesus is better also because he never changes. Verses 10 to 12, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all become old like a garment, and like a mantle, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end." The idea is this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was here before the world exists. He'll be here long, long after the world exists, and he will not ever change. We change. Even the angels throughout Scripture have been known to to change. Some of the angels rebelled against God. People change. God's creation changes. The world itself changes. One day the world itself will wear out. And the writer quotes the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, talking about how the earth itself, it says it's going to wear out like a garment, like an old t-shirt, like an old set of clothes. It's going to wear out. I remember when I was in college and then a young adult, I had a shirt, a t-shirt. I loved this t-shirt. It, it was, I realize it's, it's immature, but it was a picture of Cookie Monster. And I loved this Cookie Monster shirt. It said, got cookie on the front of it. And so I wore it. I wore it a lot. In fact, I was proud of that shirt. I remember one time I went to a restaurant wearing that shirt, and the waiter loved that shirt so much. He said, "Uh, would you give me that shirt? And he said, I will give you your meal free if you will give me that shirt. And I said, well, the problem is I don't have another shirt. I can't sit here at dinner without a shirt. And he goes, hold on. So he went back into the kitchen and he came back. He goes, okay, somebody here has an extra shirt. You can go change and I will give you a free meal if you will give me that cookie monster shirt. And I would not let go of the shirt. The fact that he wanted it so much proved to me that it was valuable. (laughs) So here's what happened though. I wore that shirt at least once or twice a week for years, for years. It it, it came into uh, our marriage actually, in fact, and I wore this shirt for years, and slowly the shirt began to disintegrate, right? It developed a little hole just from being worn and washed repeatedly, a little hole in the front. Wasn't that big a deal. At first, it wasn't that big a deal. I could still wear it, you know, to certain occasions, even though it still had a little hole. But the hole began to expand over time, and, and even I realized eventually, okay, I can't wear a shirt with a large hole on the front. So I would wear it around the house, right? I just wore it at home. And then eventually the hole expanded, and, and Cookie Monster's face was mostly uh, gone, was mostly absent, but I still wore the shirt around the house just because I love this shirt until finally one day uh, my wife Shannon came and she said, I think it's time to let it go. 
right? And I, I really struggled. I still struggled. And so she actually went and she bought me a, a replacement Cookie Monster shirt, a new Cookie Monster shirt so that I could retire the old shirt, right? No matter how much you love a piece of clothing, it's going to fade away. It's going to fall apart. It's going to disintegrate. Think of that imagery. That's the imagery that we see here in Hebrews 1. Whatever you love in this world, it will disintegrate. Your job, your bank account, your house. I mean, those of us who have houses, you know, they, they move toward disintegration and decay. Even those people that you love, they will change, they will let you down, they will die. And although we know that in Jesus Christ we will be resurrected, the reality is there's, there's nothing you're going to place your faith in in this world that is not going to change, that is not going to fade, that is not going to disintegrate. But Jesus stays the same. And Jesus remains forever. So again, the writer of Hebrews says, here's what I want you to understand. You can transfer your hope from the things of this world to Jesus. One, because only he can bring you to the presence of the Father. But two, he's he's not going to change. He's not suddenly going to change his mind and go, you know what? I'm I'm kidding about all that salvation stuff. I'm kidding about all that eternal life and peace and hope. You know what? You just, you did too many things wrong. And so now that, that offer is no longer on the table. That's not what Jesus does. He never changes. He never fades. He never lets you down. So the writer of Hebrews says, God entered into our world so we can know him again. And we in Jesus, we have a Savior that unlike everything else in the world, he won't ever change. Jesus is better. He's God. He never changes. Thirdly, because he's going to win in the end. He's going to win in the end. Look at verses 13 to 14. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? says, Jesus is greater because he's the only one that God has ever said, hey, sit, uh, sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, this quote, it comes right from Psalm 2. And the idea of Psalm 2 is this. Psalm 2 is this great psalm that opens up. It goes, hey, why are the nations raging and the kings are in an uproar and they're trying to overthrow the God of the universe? And there's this imagery. It says, the Lord in heaven, he sits and he laughs at them. I want you to think about this. He sits and he laughs. He goes, hey, there are the kingdoms of the world. All of the kings, all of the presidents, all of these great leaders who think they're in charge. And God sits on his throne. And he laughs. And he laughs because their pretension to power is ridiculous. Again, why? Because their glory pales in comparison to the glory of the Savior. And then Psalm 2 goes on and and God says, hey, you know what? As for me, I have have appointed my king. I have set up my king. So if you're smart, you'll hit the dirt. Kiss the sun. Because here's what, what happens. is Jesus dies, Jesus rises again, and in his resurrection, he defeats all of God's enemies. Sin, death, Satan. And God says, okay, you've won the victory. Now sit here at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's an image of victory. Even the greatest enemies we face, Satan and death, become a footstool for for the king of kings, the maker of the universe. Jesus is greater because he wins in the end. One day his victory will be complete. And so the great news is this, that even in the midst of of a world that changes, even in the midst of 
Chaos, even in the midst of all of these other things that we trust letting us down, even in the midst of a year where I know for a fact that there are men and women in this room, that you've, you've seen your world shift in unexpected ways and in unwelcome ways, even in a year like this, we have the confidence that Jesus wins the victory in the end, that he will win. I remember when I was a kid, probably like some of y'all, uh, I played Monopoly quite frequently with my brothers. I have two brothers. One is older and one is younger. My older brother in particular is extremely competitive, and, and somehow he almost always wins these games. He almost always wins. And one, one trick I remember him doing, I remember Dan doing this when we were a kid, is you'd be playing the game and you would think that you were winning. You would have more money, you'd have more property. But what I didn't realize was that always at the very beginning of the game, Dan would take a couple of, you know, Monopoly 500s and he would just hide them somewhere. And you didn't know he had them. And he would wait until that moment when it looked like all was lost for him. And then he would triumphantly pull out the extra money and just wipe you out. And I used to get so upset at that. But as I think about it in hindsight, I think, man, how must he have felt sitting there while we were scrambling to slowly drain him of his resources, knowing I've got a trump card. I'm going to win. Right? He never was worried. He never was afraid because he knew that he would win in the end of the game. And he almost always did. Right? This, this is the message of the book of Hebrews, ultimately, and of Hebrews chapter 1. Even if it looks like you're losing, if you're in Jesus Christ, you will win because he will win. Even in a year like this, I don't know how many people in this room would say, man, this is a year where I really feel like I'm winning, right? Most people don't. But in Jesus Christ, you will win because his victory is our victory. Even in a year where you say, man, the things that I, that I place my, my trust in, the bottom fell out. My bank account isn't what it was. Countless hours at home with my family maybe has, has revealed cracks in those relationships I didn't know were there. And that may be painful. My career, I thought it was on a certain trajectory and now it's uncertain. My health, I thought it was good, and I've been thrown a curveball. Maybe you had a family member or a close friend pass away. You say, I, I don't think I'm winning. I don't feel like I'm winning. See, the message of, of Hebrews 1, and really the message of Christmas, is that's why Jesus came. He entered into our world to defeat the enemy and to restore us to life. So the day is coming when Jesus will return. And that, that story is being told throughout the scripture all the way from the book of Genesis to the end of Revelation. That ultimately through the death and resurrection of Jesus, sin is abolished, death is abolished. And even though it looks like we're losing today, Jesus will win. So he will return. And the dead in Christ will rise. And he will then move to establish a kingdom where you have enough always to eat, to drink. You never have to worry about money again. You never have to worry about death again. You never have to worry about broken relationships again. Because there will be life eternal. So the writer of Hebrews, again, he goes, why would, you, why would you transfer your trust anywhere else? Why would you place your trust and your allegiance anywhere else? Why would you go back to what seemed glorious before? But in light of Jesus, you know that the glory of whatever else you're trusting in, whether it's the law, whether it's angels, whether it's your family, your job, whatever it is, it may be a great thing, but it pales in comparison to Jesus. So as we move into the Christmas season and toward the end of this year, here's the question that I want us to ask. 
Will you and I completely trust Jesus with our life and our future? We completely trust Jesus with our life and our future. Two thoughts then quickly on this as we close. It may be that, that you don't yet know Jesus. I realize that often at this time of year, we have friends and family that are joining us and we're glad you're here. And it may be you came in the room and, and you don't yet have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And and if that's you this morning, first of all, I'm glad, I'm really glad you're here because I want you to hear this message that you can know you have eternal life and you can know you have a future and a relationship with God if you trust in Jesus Christ. That's why he came. But then, then for those who know Jesus Christ, again, here's the question. Will you completely trust Jesus with your life and with your future? And again, I realize this year, I think for a lot of people, this year in particular, it has revealed to us the things that we have trusted besides Jesus. Because right? it may be you say, wow, I really thought that things were going to go differently this year in my home. I really thought things were going to go differently this year with my job. I really thought things were going to go differently this year in the political realm. I really thought things were going to go differently this year in a lot of ways. And sometimes the pain that that is surfaced through the loss or the change, it reveals to us what we're trusting in besides Jesus. And so I think for many of us, as we close out this year and as we think about Christmas, I really think the Spirit of God is going to say to us, what I want you to do is I want you to transfer your trust. So now you've seen firsthand. These things will change. They will wear out. They lack the glory you're looking for. But Jesus is better. And so when we come before him and we say, God, I, I, I am sorry. Forgive me because I have have placed my faith in the things of this earth. I want to place my faith in you and take the next step as I trust you with my family, with my health, with my job, with the nation. I trust you. Let me go where you lead. Will we transfer our trust over to Jesus? Would you pray with me? Father, we are thankful this morning for your word. Lord, I pray that the reality of who Jesus is and all he's done for us would would continue to be clearer and clearer to us as as we move through the Christmas season. Lord, we do ask that you would forgive us because we trust in things of this earth. And then when they let us down, Father, we get angry or we get afraid, or we become unkind, or we blame you. When all along, Father, you have told us the reality of this world in its brokenness and its sin is that it will change and it will let us down. So Lord, we pray we'd transfer our allegiance and our trust fully to you and follow where you lead. Teach us to walk with you day by day. Not to trust in the things of this earth, but to trust you with them and with our own lives. Lord, we thank you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.